my pleasure to welcome Jason Self. us in the literature. I want to relocate us from what tends to be the focus a lot of the time onto the Rappahannock and around the fall line as well, so kind of a geographic reorientation, and think about why we would talk about that history. From there, I want to get into some of those indigenous experiences with English colonization in the 17th and early 18th centuries, and then wrap up by talking a little bit about some of the diminished uh, visibility of Virginia Indians as we head into the 19th century, before some of those communities start to reemerge in the 20th century. So that's kind of my roadmap for the day. I am borrowing this term palacentrism from a scholar named James Rice. Um, a lot of times when we talk about Virginia Indian history, we're of course obligated legally to use John Smith's 1624 map, which is fantastic and gives us all kinds of great information um, but it's not comprehensive and it's not unambiguous. There are some limitations to trying to use this. Uh, notably, it doesn't reveal a lot of the complexity of that indigenous landscape. We don't get a good sense of the relationships between the different people that are listed on here, even though there's a ton of them mapped out, as you can see, obviously, and there will be another map that's a little more clear in a second. Um, we don't get a good sense all the time of the borders and connections, like where do these sort of populations or these realms, and where do they begin? Where is there another polity or another political formation that we need to think about? Where are the cultural distinctions within that? Um, and it doesn't capture the dynamics. This is a particular moment in time that he manages to capture. He's listing this in 1607, 1608, as he is navigating and exploring in this region. But a lot of these towns and these communities, they merge, they move across the river. Uh, some of them actually move seasonally. He visits at one point and he maps them on the north side of the river, and then in his narrative he says, oh, they're on the south side of the river, right? So it doesn't seem to quite line up. So we don't get a sense of all of that movement. So it can be a really helpful map, but it is, as I said, somewhat limited. Uh, Powhatan, that Powhatan Paramount chiefdom is not necessarily all that exceptional. Um, it is the most evident to the English. They visited there before. They have made friends there before. They've identified this as a group of people that they want to interact with and trade with and settle among. Um, but geographically, it's actually a little bit less expansive than some of these other cultural complexes that we'll touch on. Uh, it's also temporally fairly recent. It hasn't been around for very long. It's still under construction. Really, it's been around as kind of a unit since the late 1500s. So this is not to dismiss the significance of that realm for English and American history in particular, but it is to stress that the indigenous Chesapeake is much more polycentric than this would suggest, right? There are other centers. Other groups of people see their own, own homelands as really the middle of the world and certainly the middle of their lives. Uh, and so I want to move us to the Rappahannock fall line as a part of that conversation. I think the microphone's shrinking or I'm moving away from it. <laughs> oh, I did say I wanted to briefly touch on this other map. Uh, this one, I've only seen this uh, available in gift shops at national parks, uh, but it's a fantastic way to kind of simplify that and get out some of the um, uh, the kind of artistic renderings if you want a very clear map of these polities. The one thing I will point you to is the density of these settlements along the north bank of the Rappahannock River. And I will pop over and point that real quickly. So there are a lot of settlements there, and we'll come back and talk a little bit about why that is and why they're situated as they are. 
When I am talking about uh, the Rappahannock River, I want to think about it conceptually in two different ways. One is as an ecotone, and the other is as a borderlands, and I'm going to define those and describe what I mean. With an ecotone, we're talking about an ecological and cultural transition zone. In this case, there's an east-west division, and there's about a 10 to 20 mile buffer right around the uh, fall line uh, between the coastal and tidewater region and the Algonquian peoples who have it there, and that more upland region, the Piedmont, where there are more Siouan speakers, uh, and we'll again get into some of these groups in a minute. The earliest archaeological evidence for people along the Rappahannock River comes from about eight to 10,000 years ago. Uh, we see that presence accelerating about uh, 1,000 years BCE, and then really accelerating even more after that, beginning around 1,200 years later. Um, so within the last 2,000 years, that population really grows dramatically. Paleo-Indians draw into this region for uh, largely for its biological richness. There are a ton of resources here, and river valleys are really good for that. Um, in particular, these are people who have sort of navigated along the coastal shelf, and they're finding refuge in these river valleys as the sea levels are changing and that coastal shelf is being submerged. And they find river valleys really appealing because of a couple of factors. One is the floodplain. This deposits relatively nutrient-rich uh, soils in deposits that are good for growing wild plants and later on for horticulture, of course. You've got wetland areas that have high biomass. There's tons of aquatic life there, whether that's fin fish or shellfish. There's lots of edible soft tissue plants as well. They're fairly navigable, and there's game animals uh, to feed on as well. On top of that biological richness, you get energy imports. You have migrating a waterfowl, you have migrating fish up and down the river seasonally as well that bring extra resources into those regions. And so this situation lets natives take advantage of what we call verticality. You can move between these different resource zones, in particular the waterways, the riparian areas, and then upland areas as well. You can go up and down the river into the tidal zones to access saltwater resources or freshwater resources. You can go up into the Piedmont or up onto the peninsulas between these rivers in Virginia to access woodlands, nuts, uh, deer populations that aren't hunted year round. And so they have the ability to really move seasonally. All of this richness then is supporting a growing population and more permanent sites. People don't have to travel as much to secure those resources if they have all of that there. And so you start to see these permanent towns that are often there's kind of a core settlement and then outlying hamlets around it that they interact as well. Uh, and as they settle down, you get these more, you seem to get more differentiated populations, cultures that are associated with particular ecological zones. And so that's why we talk about this ecotone as a transition between different environments as well as different cultures. You get those downstream Algonquians and upstream Siouan speakers. When I talk about a borderland, I mean something a little bit different. In this case, I'm thinking about the Rappahannock River really as a whole, but especially uh, above Tappahannock. Um, as a sort of interstitial space between bigger political formations to the north and to the south. And so we have a lot of Rappahannock River peoples who are connected to some of these other uh, political formations, to these chiefdoms, but aren't necessarily a part of them. They're not necessarily subjects, which is not to say that they don't trade, they don't fight, they don't intermarry, right? They certainly do that, they have relationships. So the Rappahannock River is on that northern edge of the Palatine chiefdom, encompassing Zanacomago, about 13 to 15,000 people, probably. The estimates vary, obviously. Um, covering about 6,000 square miles, maybe a little bit more. 28 to 34 unified or culturally similar groups, depending again on how you count, organized into that political chiefdom, the paramount chiefdom, beginning in the late 1500s. The Rappahannock River is also just south of the Piscataway Tyac that forms and centers on the north bank of the Potomac River. During an earlier period of climate change, a lot of Susquehanna River people had sort of migrated south onto the Potomac, pushed some of those uh, upper Potomac peoples further down the river, and they had formed up a kind of defensive mechanism, right? A larger, uh, they merged into a larger hereditary chiefdom in response to that. And so the Rappahannock River, really a boundary zone between these two polities, um, where you have a lot of people who are working to maintain their independence and their autonomy. They're fairly far away from some of the political centers of the Piscataway, Tyak, and Powhatan chiefdom, and so that affords them some autonomy. They often have fairly large numbers, and so they're able to sustain that and defend themselves as well. 
And so I think that should inform uh, what we will actually see as we think about their experiences. All right, so to get a little bit into these indigenous political configurations of the Rappahannock fall line, um, we see some of this in Smith's 1608 voyage. He's, of course, visiting a lot of these people. One group I want to think about is the Rappahannock, and the English named the river after the Rappahannocks. Um, I'm sort of identifying them as the strongest people on that river. Um, it seems like just prior to this, maybe again a generation or so, the river had been known as the Episcatumic, and so this is a fairly recent uh, kind of shift in terms of who is the most dominant group of people there. Uh, they are not organized as a paramount chiefdom. It's really a bunch of neighboring peer polities. I pointed at all of those little, that list, right, going up the Rappahannock River. These people are all affiliated with each other. They interact with each other. But there's not necessarily just one dominant center for that region. Uh, Smith, when he arrives, is actually told by the people further downriver that the Rappahannocks are uh, sort of scary and independent and not part of Powhatan's chiefdom. They're trying to warn him not to go. And indeed, when he encounters them the first time, they get in a fight. And he kind of escapes upriver, and then he comes back, and they feast and hang out for a little while. Um, and so they seem to develop that relationship a little bit more strongly. Um, mentioned earlier when I pointed at that map that you have a lot of these town and village sites on the northern side of that river. And you can see that in this map detail, I think. Uh, sort of in the bottom uh, middle there. Uh, for a long time, we historians, archaeologists, anthropologists uh, interpreted this as a defensive mechanism, right? That they were moving to the far side of the river to create a sort of barrier between the Rappahannocks and the Powhatan chiefdom. But there's been some recent work uh, combining a lot of oral history as well as a lot of archaeology to try to kind of identify these settlement sites and think about why it is that people settled there. And there's a bunch of factors that seem to have gone into it. Um, those sites are the ones that offer the best combination of visibility, so they have elevation and they can see up and down the river fairly well. So that matters for travel and communication. They have proximity to biologically rich wetlands, which I talked about a couple of minutes ago, so there's lots of good resources. There's easy access to floodplains for planting. And there are useful clay deposits that the Rappahannocks are using. And so what we actually see in these North, uh, North Bank settlements is a lot of sophisticated environmental knowledge. This isn't necessarily just uh, trying to get away from palatine aggression. Our next group would be the Patagonic. Uh, and the Patagonic, Smith actually encounters for the first time on the south side of the Potomac River. But historically, they have some associations with the coalition, including the Piscataway, centered on the northern region of the Chesapeake Bay. And if you look at the archaeological evidence for the Patagonic, you find lots of structured and palisaded villages, material culture like cord marked ceramics and Z twist cordage, and some burial practices as well that are reminiscent and really reflective of a sort of larger culture that's centered on the northern part of the Chesapeake Bay, much more than the Powhatan realm. Um, it spans western Maryland, the eastern shore, and western New York as well. That relationship and that close association with those people to the north of the Potomac seems to be dissolving a little bit by the time the English arrive in the early 1600s. And the Padawan had recently begun paying tribute to Powhatan and sort of initiated this relationship with him. Again, this is, I want to emphasize, this is not a sort of subjugation. This is how do we maintain a relationship and a friendly relationship with somebody who could potentially be a friend. Um, one thing to uh, add, and I have it, I think, translated up here, uh, is that this name, Patawomek, has been translated a number of different ways. But two of those offerings are to bring again, they go and come, and trading center. So really emphasizing that they are knit into some exchange networks. Uh, in particular, there are shell masks that have been excavated that seem to have origins in the Tennessee River Valley. They also have an antimony mine, uh, which is kind of a metallic element that is really common in paints and dyes and circulates around this region. And so these kinds of connections and these kinds of resources do help them maintain some of that autonomy. Right? They can um, trade it. So the Potomac River for these folks is not really a boundary. It's more of a connective tissue, that, and their homelands span both sides of it. So even though they have that northern association, being on that south side is still within that larger conception of a Padawanic homeland, right? And then our third group, which is kind of on the edge of Smith's map, to think about the Manahoic uh, a little bit. 
One scholar has described Manahoic as part of the greater Monacan world, thinking about a much larger uh, sort of cultural complex, as I said earlier. Uh, this is a population that seems to have about 14 to 15,000 people spread across around 30,000 square miles, so much less densely populated than uh, Tidewater, Virginia. But they are marked as a distinct culture by burial practices. There's this series of what we call accretional mounds, where they add burials over time. And this uh, sort of roots them in an ancestral homeland. There are ceremonies and rituals surrounding that that kind of solidify that community. And none of their neighbors do this. So this is pretty distinctive as a trait, which is how we can sort of map out that geography. The Manahoic area itself, which you see up here, seems to encompass about 1,000 to 1,500 people with a really diverse subsistence base, fishing, hunting, some maize agriculture as well. And they're kind of on the northern end of this larger uh, Monacan world. So in terms of indigenous relations with each other at the fall line, we get Spanish sources as far back as the 1570s that say uh, that these are populations that fight with each other, that people come down out of the mountains, out of the Piedmont, and attack Tidewater Virginians. And then that's the story that the English get as well. Certainly Smith, he is being, when he goes up the Rappahannock in 1608, he's being guided by uh, Moscow, and they encounter a Moralek, capture a Moralek, who's a uh, Manahoic Indian, and Moscow tries to kill him. So there's definitely signs of tension here. Um, they are converging seasonally in this buffer zone. Right? I talked about that ecotone as a fall line, uh, which isn't necessarily permanently inhabited. There are people visiting there constantly, but it has a lot of these work sites, seasonal camps, seasonal resources. And so you get this convergence during, say, fishing season, um, when you've got shad runs and herring runs. Uh, and there are instances of exchange. It does seem like um, you do get this sort of separation of that Siouan and Algonquian realm, but there also seems to be some friendly interchange. There are trade goods that we can track across both of those different regions. So that is sort of our setup for the English entering into this world. Hopefully we've got a sense of that larger environment and the kind of political configurations in that spot. The English settlers at Jamestown are definitely not the first uh, Englishmen or Europeans that uh, these Indians on the Rappahannock have actually encountered. We know that there are European explorers coming into the Chesapeake Bay by the 1520s, that there's Spanish and French activity from the 1540s to the 1580s. There's dozens of references to Spanish and English ships from the 1580s into the early 1600s that are orbiting the Chesapeake Bay, not necessarily settling just yet. Roanoke colonists had actually come up into the bay in 1585 and 1586, and that's part of what inspired subsequent English, uh, English voyages into that region, including the Chesapeake, and sometimes up into these rivers. In 1603, there's a guy named Samuel Mace who leads an expedition, and he reports that he was kindly entertained by Powhatan, their emperor, on the Pamunkey or New York River. Uh, he also reports that he discovered the river Tappahannock and was received with like kindness at the capital town. This account then kind of goes sideways with no explanation, and it concludes, his visit to the Rappahannock concludes, he slew the king and took up his people. <laughs> Not sure exactly what happened there. Um, so he's kidnapping a few people. And we do have a report later on in 1603, which would be enough time for them to get back, of two quote unquote Virginia Indians being paid for a canoe demonstration on the Thames River in London. So not only are the English coming to Virginia, it seems like Virginians are headed to English as a part of this as well. All of this is to say that Indians are really familiar with Europeans, whether that's by a first-hand contact and they've met and interacted and traded and fought or been kidnapped, or uh, rumors and material items right, that sort of make their way into these uh, networks of native information. People know things, they know a little bit about what to expect, and these early contacts help set some precedents. They might be really sporadic, brief interactions, but that does shape what happens later on. We see instances of trading, of hosting and feasting, of fighting, and of kidnapping. Those more sustained interactions are natives and Europeans, English, are consistently sort of assessing those relationships and trying to negotiate and shape, right? They have their own interests. Uh, they're wary of each other. They realize that these relationships can be dangerous, but they also find something appealing in that other side. They want something out of the people that they're encountering. As I go on a little bit, we're going to talk more about the Patawomic and Rappahannox, uh, in large part because for the Monacan and the Manahoic, we don't get that sustained interaction. 
there seems to be kind of a mutual disinterest in actually developing a relationship. Uh, those Zoom people in the Piedmont are a little bit more oriented into the Ohio Valley and some of these southeastern networks that tie them to trade coming out of the Gulf Mexico region. Um, and the English don't have a whole lot that they seem to want. The big appeal for some of those coastal peoples of English trade is copper, which is red, which is symbolically, uh, which is uh, sort of culturally and, uh, you know, I got a hand in the back, so I need to speak up. Which is, so red is spiritually significant. It helps to moderate between these binary opposites of white and black on sort of a color scheme. Copper is also potentially reflective, which is a way of mediating with the spiritual world. So copper really important and appealing to coastal peoples who don't have their own sources. Monacans have their own sources independent of the English, and so they don't find anything appealing there. They're also far away from those coastal settlements that the English are establishing in places like Jamestown. So they don't really keep up that relationship. And when the English make their way back up the Rappahannock and above the fall line uh, on an expedition in 1668, they don't find the Manawa. But on a different visit in 1670 to the Monacans uh, down on the James, they're referring to their relatives on the Rappahannock River. So we know that there's some continued presence. What seems to happen is that the Manahoic really, their settlements shrink. They're moving away from major waterways, trying to get away from where there's going to be these travel routes by the English. Um, and they are exposed to some of these raids from northern Iroquoian raiders. And so they seem to sort of choose seclusion, and some of them probably move south and join these other Monacan communities there. I didn't have much to say about this, but I just wanted to show you some archaeological um, fragments from Bushnell's studies. All right, so getting into English settlement a little bit more directly. The Virginia Assembly really tries to carefully manage uh, expansion, at least it pretends that it's carefully trying, um, largely because it doesn't want to spark more and more of these costly wars with Virginia Indians. It does allow patents on the Rappahannock River for the first time in 1641 on the condition that the parties that, that there intend to seat are hereby commanded to compound with the native Indians there, whereby they may live the more securely. So it grants land rights, but it also stipulates that these settlers need to negotiate with the people who actually live there to work out an arrangement to pay them for that land, to compensate them, to figure out where they can actually settle. These patents, beginning in 1641, actually get suspended by 1644. There's the Third Anglo-Algonquian War. Uh, and then encumbered, encumbered by a 1646 treaty that reserves lands north of the York River to Indians. This doesn't last very long, and by the 1650s, the assembly has started to grant new patents along the Rappahannock River. Again, you see that kind of arrangement where the assembly authorizes this, but there's the expectation that locals will actually then engage with these indigenous communities. A 1652 law uh, allowed Northumberland County specifically to, uh, it allowed that, um, those county commissioners the power to settle peace with the Indians in their counties and to treat with them upon all occasions that shall happen for the keeping of peace amongst them. This is granted to all counties that are frontier upon the Indians like those upstream on the Rappahannock River. So this is authorizing those local governments then to negotiate with uh, the people that are neighboring on them. So English settlement is moving up that Rappahannock River. There's settlers at the Port of Bay by 1650. In 1666, John Catlett obtains a land patent that spans the fall line on the Rappahannock. Um, it reverts to the crown because, because he doesn't cede it, but we get a sense of that activity expanding up river. And then, of course, Fredericksburg chartered in 1728. In the midst of this, we have two levels of interactions uh, that proceed, and they accompany each other. They run in parallel. One is between political entities, thinking about sovereign nations or sovereign people who are each independent of each other. And the other level is really between individuals, a lot of personal relations. And so I want to address both of those. Sorry, lots of birds on this. Uh, I think it's notable that there is that 1646 treaty that results from a colony-wide war, 
and their 1641 and 1652 laws passed at the colonial level for patenting and settling the Rappahannock River lands uh, that delegate that task to locals. So you have county commissioners, county courts, sometimes individual proprietors who are all pursuing these relationships and these agreements with local chiefs, independent of explicit approval from that central government. A lot of times these do get entered into county records, sometimes just briefly as a sort of mention that there is an agreement, sometimes you get some additional details. So a couple of examples to look at. On the left, we've got the rapid, some agreements with the Rappahannocks, uh, and one of those is from 1651, an agreement with Moore Fauntleroy uh, for a pact. And it says, I, Occupatia, the right born and true king of the Indians, of the Indians of Rappahannock town and towns, in consideration of 10 fathoms of peak and goods, do bear unto my loving friend and brother, Moore Fauntleroy, a certain parcel of land. So you have a land conveyance, not surprisingly, given this period of settlement, and you have that kinship language, trying to sort of represent the personal relationship between them. And Fauntleroy continues to uh, engage in these kinds of deals, and he does have that kind of long-standing relationship. In 1652, uh, the governor moves to protect Indian land. He's concerned about uh, the sort of morality of displacing Indians and proposes a series of preserves uh, where there would be a couple thousand acres on which Indians could live. In 1653, then, the assembly assigned a tract to Towerson and ordered he be king of all the Indians of the Rappahannock Nation, and that an English house of this country's fashion shall be builded for him accordingly for the preservation of peace between them and the inhabitants of this river. Uh, there's other pieces of this agreement recorded. The Rappahannocks are allowed to bring suits in county courts, so they have legal access. They agreed to stop stealing livestock as the uh, settlers saw it, and that they would help catch runaway servants and slaves. So they are, again, yeah, forming this relationship, coming up with a series of uh, provisions within this larger agreement. The house here, it's hard to tell whether this is a sign of assimilation, Towerson wants to live in an English-style house, or if this is kind of a prestige item. This is a way of demonstrating his connection to the English and his stand. He has something special that nobody else does. It also, though, is kind of interesting in that it doesn't specify that anybody has to move away, right? They can stick around in that same spot. The, okay, sorry. Um, we also get on the right hand side here a couple of these agreements referencing the Patawomics. One is a 1624 letter, and that's the first one here, that references an agreement made the last year by Mr. Treasurer with the Pat Potomacs, our ancient allies, to assist us in that revenge against the Anacostans and to accompany us and be our guides in a war against the Pamunkeys. And so there's a military alliance here, which I think is interesting. They are attacking the Anacostans, who had been responsible for the death of Henry Spellman, an Englishman, not long before this. They're also agreeing to help the English against the Pamunkeys. So that assertion of independence, right? The Potomacs recognizing, hey, if we have the English as allies, that'll help us maintain our independence um, from potentially a threatening neighbor. Uh, and that reference to ancient allies. This is not a new relationship. This is not the first version of this, right? They're referencing years before. There's also an example uh, comparable to Fauntleroy's with the Rappahannocks. In 1655 in Westmoreland County, we get this agreement between the King of Potomac and Gerard Fauk. Uh, Gentleman Gerard doth give the king and horse with bridle and saddle upon these considerations, that Gerard shall build himself a house on the same land where the king now live, live it on, the, on, and Gerard shall put thereon what English servants he pleases, and plant tobacco and corn, and keep what cows he pleases, he give, giving to him one cow to give his children milk. If the king of Potomac cause any Indians to join in the crop, he shall have one moiety according to their labor. So we've got some similar things and some different things happening here, right? We've again got permission for Fout to build a house and start farming and raising livestock on Indian land. But again, this doesn't specify that Indians are going to leave. They're kind of trying to position neighbors. They see a benefit in having English neighbors for trade, for defensive purposes, whatever it might be. Um, and the king is certainly getting something here. He's getting livestock, he's getting a horse and bridle. He's also getting the opportunity to find employment for his people, right? Um, if the Indians join in the crop, they shall, he shall have one boati. So they're finding employment, they're finding these economic opportunities there. 
So I'll talk a little bit more generally about this. Overall, what we've got is a series of what amount to agreements negotiated between these people. So we can think of them as treaties. They're certainly taking different forms than we often think of for treaties. Uh, these are land conveyances, they're laws and orders, they're unrecorded agreements that just sort of get these offhanded references, like that one in 1624. And so they're not necessarily the written documents we often think of with a series of articles and a bunch of signatures at the end. That's something that's developing over the course of the 17th century, and we know that the Treaty of Middle Plantation is one instance of that in 1677, so we know how those are going to look. Treaties are more generally referred to by 17th century Virginians as an agreement or even the larger set of negotiations. There's one instance when Giles Brent and Gerard Fawkes, who we were just talking about, refer to the ending of the treaty with the does. And in this case, there is no document. They just say, we're going to accept that payment for the cow that they killed, and that's the end of this treaty, right? So they're using that term to talk about a larger set of negotiations. For Indians, they're getting a bunch of things out of these treaties. They're affirming their political standing, uh, the leadership as well, right? Chiefs are able to kind of encode their leadership position in these documents or these agreements. They're establishing their independence. They are confirming friendships and establishing neighbors that they want to have living nearby. They're securing access to trade goods and trade partners as well. They're bolstering their independence against other groups, and they're reflecting their sense of how land ownership or land uh, tenure works, that you can share these spaces, uh, and that it might be temporary as well. For the English, they're gaining access to land. They're hoping to secure peace so they can more productively and peacefully farm and raise livestock there. They are developing a relationship with native leaders that helps them pursue that peace as well. And they're able to enter these agreements into legal documents uh, in the English court system to help establish their ownership down the road. Rappahannocks and Patawomics also, though, falling under colony-wide laws. Uh, in 1662, we get an act concerning Indians that addressed land claims and legal rights and guaranteed annual visits to Indian towns to actually then proclaim this. The following Articles of Peace take care that no entrenchments be henceforth made further upon the Indians. And so this is making sure that there are regular renewals, that this treaty, this negotiation, or this law is not one time. You don't just have a transaction and it's done and it persists forever. It's recognizing that expectation that you need to maintain that, that you need to come back and visit. Um, it doesn't specify who is covered here, but we have evidence that the Patawomics, for instance, are under this law. Uh, in that uh, law, it says that there would be silver and copper badges given to all the adjacent kings within our protection. And we know the Padawomics are included because we have that badge that gets uh, unearthed in Caroline County in 1832. We also know that later in that year, uh, Wahonganoche is accused of murder and arrested by colonists and taken to the colonial assembly. And the central government decides that he's been wrongly accused, acquits him, and orders that the people who arrested him compensate him for that, that they have to pay him off. And this is, again, one of the provisions of that 1662 law that says that land sales have to be attested by Indians, and there are protections from arbitrary arrests. So even though it doesn't specify which groups, we have a sense right, of how it actually is put into practice. There is a 1663 law that names specifically the kings of Potomac and all the rest of the northern Indians and require them to report any strange Indians whatsoever not tributary to the English. And so this is setting them up as tributaries and making a distinction between neighboring or friendly Indians and Indians from abroad, Iroquois and raiders coming from the north in particular. We should not be at all surprised that these agreements are frequently violated. It's not just bad faith. Certainly, that is the case sometimes. But there are also very different understandings of some of these provisions. The English and the Indians understand them very differently. Those land transactions, for instance. English settlers often understand, maybe willfully, but they often understand those land transactions as sales. You have sold that land. You have no more right to it. I paid you one time, and that is it. Natives understand this more as continued use. We want you to be our neighbors. As long as you're happy with you, you can use this land and we can share it. But we might need to renegotiate that or move you off of that later on. Uh, the English also understand this as private property that they want to fence and keep everyone else out. Natives are selling that with the understanding that if you're not farming there and I'm not trampling your crops, I can go through this land that we, you are now using, and I can access waterways or hunting grounds. And that's not a problem, because it's not trespassing. So that's one circumstance here. 
circumstances change, right? Sometimes these agreements are reached and people move, they move around. You have things that are hard to control. You might agree that this is the boundary between us, but squatters might come onto the native side of it, or English livestock might invade there as well. If there's wandering animals, they look like game. Of course you're going to hunt them. There's also some gaps within these communities um, that form. The colonial governments often we see really invested in maintaining peace. It doesn't want to spend the money or the resources on a large scale war, but locals who are settling on these uh, rivers, they want to obtain land. They want to expand inwards. And so they might ignore the orders of that central government. Uh, within native communities, they might form an agreement and the neighboring town with a different chief, a different uh, werewolves or leader might say, no, we don't adhere to that and they go, continue to go about their business and they don't observe those provisions, right? And the English don't necessarily make a clear distinction between those groups of people. And so sometimes this is misunderstanding, sometimes it is, as I said, willful violations, but certainly those perceived failures to uphold the terms lead to reprisals and escalation, right? This builds up and you get antagonism, you get conflict and you do get war. So one example of this that I want to point to, and there's others, right? There are constantly uh, these earlier Anglo-Algonquian wars. You also get smaller scale conflicts sometimes within counties. One of them comes in 1666 when colonists complain that vile, execrable murders are and have been so committed by a combination of our northern Indians, particularly the Doge, conjunct with our neighbor Indians, and the governor orders in response that the whole nation of Dogues and Potomacs be forthwith prosecuted with war to their utter destruction if possible, and that their women and children and their goods, or so much of it as shall be taken, be disposed of, and added that it may be done without charge for the women and children will defray it. Basically, we'll capture them and sell them. So this authorizes a total war and the seizure of property and enslavement, and it gets referred back to the local court and militia. We don't have really extensive documentation that this happens, it's worth saying. There's no direct confirmation in documents, but it does fit a larger pattern. We know that this happens at other times, other places in colonial Virginia. And we do get this kind of oblique reference a little bit later on in Stafford County, later that same year, that the court doth order that the soldiers which were pressed in this country forthwith disbanded. This doesn't clarify where they were formed up, why they were formed up. It doesn't say they went to war in this particular instance but it also doesn't not say that. So it's kind of intriguing. It seems that this may well have happened, and this is a moment where the Patawomic largely disappear from that record. You see references to them, you see lots of native people referenced as Indians, but you don't see this political formation after this for, uh, very often. There's a similar episode in 1705, a little bit further down river, where Colin is frustrated by the way that the central government is protecting the Nanzatico community, uh, accused a bunch of Nanzaticos, I think there's seven of them who are directly accused, uh, and puts the entire community under arrest and tries these seven men. They execute those men, and then they transport the surviving adults to Antigua for sale, and we can document this ship. Uh, they find the children under the age of 12 as servants in English households, and they seize all of the property in that town and sell it off. So the Nanzaticos, sort of moving to a different group in some ways, but the Nanzaticos were really closely related with the Rappahannocks to the extent that we know that they lived together in 1697 on the Nanzatico Preserve, and the Rappahannocks kind of moved back and forth between some of these different regions. And so they may be a part of that group. Nanzatico survivors may end up with the Rappahannocks as well. Right? These boundaries, as I said, aren't always totally clear. And then of course we get Bacon's Rebellion in 1676 and 1677 as well which is simultaneously an uprising against the colonial government and a war uh, against the Indians that's partly uh, trying to expand that realm in which the English can actually settle. They want to eliminate some of that native competition, uh, and they're not making a great distinction between foreign and friendly Indians in this case. And this results in the Treaty of Middle Plantation 1677, which we've got up there, which doesn't include the Patawomics, uh, doesn't include a direct signature from the Rappahannocks, but the Pamoki signed on their behalf. But it does include a bunch of these other groups who are related to these people. All right. So that was kind of the large scale interactions between these groups. There's also personal relations that are continuing. And a lot of times these are much less visible and prominent in records. They're everyday, so they're not remarkable. There's no reason to preserve uh, those memories. 
One area in which this is happening, of course, is trade. We've seen this referenced before. The initial focus is often on those prestige items. I talked about copper a little bit earlier on. But you also get, as you have a lot of English and native neighbors, you get everyday exchanges. Uh, Indians are trading uh, mats, baskets, wooden trays, pottery, canned deer skins, sometimes captives, and they're purchasing iron tools, guns, cloth, things that they can integrate into their everyday lives. So again, a lot of this is relatively informal. This is just between neighbors, although you do have independent traders who are operating, and we don't have great records of these traders because they're kind of protecting their trade secrets and their personal relationships as they're moving around these river systems and the bay as a whole. You do get instances of labor, employment, Indians going to work for English colonists. This seems to be less frequent earlier on when they have an independent land base and they're more able to sustain their own communities and themselves uh, as they are moving on to preserves and these limited land bases, they can't engage in all of those subsistence activities and so they start to find employment as loggers, as laborers, um, as tenant farmers sometimes on these larger plantations as well. And in the midst of this, we get conversions, uh, people assimilating, just sort of adopting English names and language and lifestyles, but also converting to Christianity. There's a missionary out of Maryland who comes across the river in 1642 and spends seven weeks living with the Patagonics and reports that he converts a number of people. And then some of these Maryland converts move across the Potomac into that region as well. And so it seems very possible that there is sort of a network of Christian converts who are communicating with each other and supporting each other in this case. And one final thing to think about here is the slavery and servitude that we saw referenced in some of those uh, war authorizations in 1666 and 1705. Early on, there are frontier areas with labor shortages, and you see instances of captivity, outright enslavement there. Later on, some of this transforms and we get more debt relations. Natives go into debt because of trade or because of economic difficulties, and they end up indenturing themselves out, basically selling contracts uh, to pay off those debts over time. And these are levels that really do coincide. They run in parallel, they overlap, but over time, as some of these communities become less strong, as the populations diminish, as they don't have a separate land base, what we get is that sort of erosion of those sovereign relations and the continuation of those personal relations. People continue to assimilate, trade with each other, marry with each other, uh, and work for each other as well. So we're kind of into the home stretch here. Um, that there is that degree of visibility that I tried to emphasize earlier on in the 17th century. That is diminishing over time, as I've said. Amoralek, that Manahoic Indian, had explained his people's hostile response to Smith and the English by saying that they had heard the English had come to take their world from them. And this is kind of prescient, right? He is predicting what does happen as uh, native presence diminishes, as they are kind of overwhelmed by growing numbers of English settlers. The Padawanics, as I said, really largely disappear as an identifiable group after 1666, after that war. Uh, the Rappahannocks after 1705. But it's probably more that two related things happen, not that these are all people who've entirely disappeared. One is that it becomes much harder for historians to find them, to identify them in documents, especially in terms of details. If they don't have a large enough community and enough of a land base to be a kind of ongoing concern for the English government, they're not going to be documented in those legal records. Um, and so they're not necessarily operating in a community in the same concerted way as they had before when they appeared more regularly. That might be amplified by the destruction or loss of some records, which we know happens in Virginia in various wars and just over time, things get lost. The second thing that's happening here is that some of these people are retreating. They're choosing seclusion, either as a group, maybe families, maybe a larger uh, group of related families, or as individuals to avoid conflicts and destruction. They're motivated to become less visible because they faced colonists who were racialized and pushed them off of lands, uh, enslaved them, and refused to distinguish between friendly and hostile Indians. And so some of them take refuge in more remote areas, off of streams. They merge together into different groups and relocate in some cases as well. So Ed Reagan, who's a historian who's worked extensively with the Rappahannocks, said, likes to say that the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Some of this evidence does diminish. It's hard to find, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the people go away. They might transform. They might not appear in these colonial institutions in the same ways. Um, but that's not to say that they are gone. 
Some of them do assimilate. They anglicize, they convert to Christianity, as I said. A lot of times this is happening as individuals. Um, they are pursuing relationships with some of those settlers as well. We still get people a lot of times who are identified in those colonial records as Indians. You get like Indian Sam, Indian John. You don't know what communities they belong to. We don't have more specific descriptors, but there is that suggestion that they are uh, indigenous and often these are appearing in traditional homelands. And so you might draw the conclusion that this is a descendant of somebody who had lived there for a long time. In other instances, they seem to be subsumed into other racial categories. They are intermarrying and anglicizing. They're moving into those English communities for work and survival. They might be passing as white, uh, but there is not the same sort of concern with these colored categories sometimes in early Virginia. Uh, if you go back to the early 1600s, most often you see references to the Christian race rather than whites, right? Uh, and so if you convert to Christianity, you may be part of that Christian race, especially over time. In other cases, people who are in those sort of marginal communities or enslaved seem to be lumped, lumped together with other people of color. And you just get that single category of colored people to the extent that you have Indians from the Indian subcontinent, you have Africans, you have native people who are all subsumed by that single label. So within all of this, tribal functions change, but those identities remain. Right? People remember this. Uh, they continue to practice some of that material culture, fishing techniques, construction, things like that, some of that ecological knowledge or oral traditions may be passed down through those families. And so natives in Virginia really are transforming much more than they're disappearing. By the late 19th century, early 20th century, we do see, start to see some of these communities re-emerging much more visibly. Uh, there's turn of the century anthropologists working with the Pamunkey between 1893 and 1908, and the Pamunkey are making references to other communities that they knew in Virginia. And this leads to subsequent anthropological studies into the 1920s to try to document culture and technology of the Pamunkey, the Patawomic, especially the Waterman, uh, Rappahannocks as well. There are records being taken of oral traditions and stories. There's photographs of some of these folks. And in lots of cases, those anthropologists are linking those groups, those communities that they find in the 20th century to their 17th and 18th century predecessors, trying to think about how they might have descended and what changed about them. And they're finding lots of these rural communities, a lot of them centered on churches. This becomes kind of a new institutional center for some of these native communities. Um, they're often associated with a neighboring colored population, putting that in quotes, uh, and facing some of the same legal disadvantages that those people do in terms of obtaining schooling in the public school systems. These groups, though, do start to much more vocally assert those Indian identities. They're partic uh, participating in public events, parades. Uh, you see the Jamestown Exhibition in 1957 up here as well. They're identifying on documents like the census and birth records as Indians, and by the 1960s and 70s, also participating in Native activism around the country. And so in some cases, we can think of these as direct descendants, of course, of those earlier communities. In other cases, these are kind of coalescent communities, right? Groups of people who are coming from, say, the Nansapico and Dodigan and Rappahannock and Portobago kind of coalesce into new communities. And they're living on those ancestral homelands, but they are linking themselves together as a larger population. So to conclude, um, I, can, I feel like I can always say quite a bit about the 17th and 18th centuries. It gets much harder as we go on. There are so many of those gaps in records. It's so hard to identify people. But historians and anthropologists consistently working on reconstructing that. Now starting more and more to work with those tribes, those tribal communities as well, to reconstruct that and recapture that, or make sense sometimes of records that we haven't understood very effectively to this point. So to me, this is a sort of ongoing conversation. Uh, to make a Star Wars reference here, Yoda says always in motion is the future. We can't necessarily anticipate how that scholarship and our understanding is going to evolve. But we're also developing those new methods. And so always in motion is the past. We can reconstitute how we understand that and what we know. All right, thank you. Does anyone have a question? <laughs> All right. Well, the Indians living in the Stone Age, because they didn't have you use any metal. They didn't use sails on the boats. They'd have a wheel 
or would you call it Stone Age? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say Stone Age. I get that a lot of the most durable material available uh, to people to manufacture those technologies from is stone, and so that certainly makes sense. I think in terms of the sophistication of some of that technology, we're well beyond what we would usually associate with the Stone Age of going much further back. You have pretty sophisticated uh, fish traps and rodent traps, for instance, for hunting, right, with uh, things that you knock out and the wood falls down. Um, it, you're right about the sails, as far as I know, at least here. Um, the wheel, there's been some discussion about, and one of the points that uh, people have made about you not using wheels is that wheels often show up in some form, right? You get those like games that they display that involve a uh, disc or wheel with a hole in the middle and you throw uh, sticks through it or spears through it that's pretty widespread, for instance. But in terms of the domesticated animals that they have available to them, wheels don't always make sense. You can just as easily use skids to drag a load. Um, on, or pack dogs instead. And so wheels aren't always useful uh, for that purpose. So some of these technologies are pr really pretty advanced, but you're right that the materials in particular aren't forged metals and alloys. They do really quickly seize on that, and that becomes the major trade item that a lot of indigenous people want. So it's not like they can't figure out what to do with it. They immediately recognize that iron tools and iron weapons are incredibly useful, incredibly durable, sharp cutting edges, uh, and pursue those trade agreements. Do they have written records? Not in the sense that we think of. They have those oral traditions and use, um, so I don't know as much about, say, the groups that we're talking about in Virginia um, for sort of markings or pictographs and things like that that help to maintain those oral traditions as almost mnemonic devices. Um, so it might be that, okay, we need to remember that we got this gift from this group of people and we're going to notch it as a number of times that we've met with them. So they're keeping physical records in that sense, but it's to maintain the stories and the knowledge rather than to record all of that, if that makes the sense there. Yes. I'm intrigued with the badge uh -huh. that you had on there. I don't know if you see any more of that. Is that in a museum? Uh, it was rediscovered in 1832 in Caroline, um, and I believe it's still in the tribal center across uh, over in Stafford. Your statement on absence, is that your personal statement? The, the quote that I gave you that uh, yes. absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So that is Ed Reagan's language, uh, who's a historian who's worked extensively with the Rappahannocks. I think it's an appropriate way to think about uh, Davis. Uh, that's why I'm asking you. Well, I can give you the direct reference a little bit later if you'd like. Um, I don't. It's from his dissertation. We can find that. And then the final statement that you made is, we don't understand the records. Amen to that. <laughs> People have seized on that to say that we did not exist. There is no record. All you have to do is look at the land transfers and things like that. That's nothing in there, but Indians, they argue. So I appreciate very much you're making that Well, this is one of the things that I'm always trying to convince my students of is, so historians will talk a lot about historiography, which is a fancy way of saying the history of the history. Our understandings evolve, right? If you look at the history that we wrote 100 years ago, it's very different than what we write now. It's not to say that we always improve it as we go along. You can sometimes see these trends. There are certainly interpretations that go too far teaching a pirate class right now, and we finished a book about two weeks ago, and my students were just going, yeah, I don't buy that. Uh, which is great, right? You should read that skeptically and be aware that that interpretation is going to change. You're going to find new evidence, and documents are not transparent. We understand them in different ways as we go along. So I don't speak on behalf of Virginia tribes, but from having worked with them off and on and attending sovereignty symposiums and things like that, um, I think for a lot of those communities, they want to be recognized uh, and have a role in some of the decisions that are made that affect them. I think it is a matter of kind of navigating a dual identity in some ways. There are things that they find really important to themselves as communities, as uh, Virginia Indians, but also just as Virginia citizens and Americans. Um, and they want to kind of have that um, 
be able to balance those things. And sometimes that might mean pursuing state recognition or federal recognition. Sometimes it might mean um, showing up at cultural celebrations on campus or in town and being able to speak to that. Sometimes it might mean something like consulting on environmental projects and environmental impacts related to development. Um, sorry, that's a very general answer about sort of inclusion and those voices being heard. I'm wondering what the origin of the Indians were before the Europeans started to arrive, and also why the Indians were not more technologically advanced. So this gets complicated, right? So the origins get tricky um, because we certainly have migration stories. Uh, the long-standing one has related to people coming across that Bering Ice Bridge um, and that sort of dissemination of people around the Americas. That doesn't always line up with archaeological evidence that sometimes seems to be much older than that. Uh, and so there's a very real possibility of multiple migrations, possibly across the South Pacific, um, coastal migration earlier before that uh, sort of identifiable Clovis technology spreads around the continent. Um, and so we can push that back maybe 30 or 40,000 years. You also have origin stories that natives are um, articulate that they were created here, right? And I think it's hard to dismiss those, except sometimes uh, the origin story in Christianity as literal. And so why do, would we dismiss those native creation stories in the same way? So I think there's a lot of possibilities and a lot that you have to sort of factor in. Um, in terms of technology, sometimes there is the possibility that this is a recent arrival, right? If people have moved to a region, they might not have brought a lot of those technologies with them. Uh, there is that argument that technology is created by sort of a crossroads, and Europe is at the middle of the Mediterranean and Asia and Africa and able to borrow from all of those, and you don't have that quite the same way in the Americas. Uh, there's also, I sort of referenced this earlier, technologies that are really advanced and really appropriate uh, for where these people live and how they live. So farming on these terraced mountainsides in the Andes, they still can't successfully farm there commercially. We don't know what to do with that, but they figured it out. Um, we do have these really sophisticated irrigation systems on, say, the Snake River in the Southwest. Uh, you have canals and aquaculture in parts of Florida where they built up pools and raised fish to eat, uh, which is getting yeah, pretty advanced. Um, but not necessarily metal. I think there were some groups in South America that were starting to experiment with some metal alloys, uh, but it wasn't very far along. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>